Well, some of Canada's biggest unions weighed in today on the federal government's new pay equity plan. The new legislation requires all federally regulated employers, such as banks, transport and telecommunications industries, broadcast media, and of course all federal workplaces, including Parliament Hill, to set up pay equity regimes within the next three years. How satisfied are the unions with the pay equity bill? Let's find out. Uh, Debbie Davio is the president of the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada, and Hassan Youssef is the president of the Canadian Labour Congress. Good to see you both. Okay, thank you. So, um, you know, I, I, I know you do have some limited concerns about uh, the legislation the government's put forward and the, the process uh, they're now embarked on in terms of what it means to, to, for the pay equity process in this country, but let me start there. Uh, what does it mean that the, the ball is actually being moved down the road here um, or down the field as after so many years of fighting for this, there is now a pay equity plan from the federal government? Well, you know, one way of describing this, um, if women are going to have economic equality, you need to have equality in how we treat them and pay them at work. And I think this legislation entrenches that principle as a human rights principle, which has also been part of Canada Human Rights Act, that pay equity is a law. But yet far too many employers, and of course, uh, including the federal government in its own sphere, haven't yet uh, uh, done that. The legislation tabled on Monday, and obviously that will manifest itself over the next little bit, are going to ensure that women are actually going to be paid uh, their worth. And ultimately, I think this will transform our country in terms of women able to get themselves out of a situation where they're living in poverty, having better pensions, and ultimately able to have a better life because they're paid what they're worth in the society. Debbie, Debbie, let me hear from you. So this is a, this is a um, I, I suppose, formally maybe the last dozen or more years, but it's a decades-old fight here for, for yeah. pay equity in this country. What's, what's the significance of the federal government actually now moving on this? Well, I think it's really important in terms of playing that leadership role. I mean, if you go back to when uh, Trudeau was elected and brought in a gender equal cabinet, that had an impact throughout Canadian society, a positive impact. And and uh, I think this pay equity legislation has the potential to do that as well uh, for all workers. But, uh, you know, certainly we do find the timelines uh, long, given how long we've already been in this fight, but we want to make sure that it's done right. And we appreciate that there is a process that will need to be followed in order to get to that proactive pay equity legislation uh, and we just wish they would have started a decade ago and then we'd be further ahead. Why, why, is, a, why is a three year lag time or a setup time, why is that reasonable? Well there are a number of um, pieces to this legislation that needs to be put in place. The regulations need to be drafted, you need to set up a pay equity commission. We just came through a process the government announced in 2016 they're going to ban asbestos. It took two years to write, vet the regulation that's going to carry out that responsibility. But you need to get it right. And you can't, uh, I think we can learn lots from other regimes, but ultimately the government's got to make sure the regulation match the commitment of the legislation, but also the commission that's going to help make this all work properly are also in place. And the timing of this is going to be really important. Well, let me ask you about that. How, um I mean, we're not reinventing the wheel here. I yes. mean, we're trying to implement a new wheel, I guess, yeah. but we're not reinventing that wheel in terms of compensating people equally. So um, what could go wrong? I mean, when you, you want to get it right, well, what, what, what could go wrong in this process if it doesn't, if they don't take three years and take time a, to do it A right? lot can go wrong if they don't take the time to consult all the stakeholders, to consider all of the facts and evidence in front of them, to, uh, to uh, vet the, the language that they're writing and so th these things do take a considerable amount of time when you're standing up new offices like the new commission uh, in government it takes extra long compared to uh, elsewhere so uh, I think uh, you know three years is a is um, a reasonable timeline to have put out there with any luck we'll get there sooner than that but uh, I appreciate that it's going to take a while to get the, uh, the to dot all the I's and cross all the T's and make sure that the correct inputs were considered as that process goes forward. Other than timelines, is there any other major concerns you have about it or even well, even not so major concerns about how, how this might work? We raised uh, two this morning and one of them are more in, in the context of the, the Commission for it to be effective, we need to have adequate resources and the staffing that's going to help because the party's going to go there when they're stuck and can't figure things out, and I think that's critical. Uh, hoping the 2019 budget will clarify the Commission's uh, resources for do its work and how we'll be able to do its staffing. But in addition to that, there was one particular um, in the definition of how the language is written. 
We had a concern. We have raised that with the government. I think on both sides are now uh, hard at uh, work looking what at. What was the concern? Well, the concern is that we didn't want the employer to have a loophole uh, in terms of meeting their obligations under pay equity. Uh, we're just reading the language, and we're not mm -hmm. sure whether this kind of gives people an opportunity to not uh, respond to their responsibility. And trying to clarify it, of course, we have other jurisdictions who have done this, both Quebec and Ontario, and we can learn something from those two experiences right now. Yeah, I think we, we also want to make sure that uh, they don't simply go around using their own federally regulated employees and move out to the use of contractors or temporary help. And, uh, and although we expect that those sectors that are delivering services into the federal public service should be covered by this new legislation. Is that specified in the uh, legislation that if you're a contract worker, you, you, you pay, the pay equity rules will apply to you as well. It is, and I, I think we'd like to see a little more clarity around that item, though, as well, a little more uh, certainty that that's the way it's going to be implemented, and of course, that will be part of the consultations that take place over the next year or so. The Federal Contractors Program, which is part of when the federal government tendered or, or, or let contracts out, will be covered by the pay equity legislation. I think that's a good thing, because that will have reach in terms of private sector. But in addition to that, of course, this legislation cover all of the private sector that falls under the federal jurisdiction, including the banks. And I, I, at the end of the day, that will be an enormous um, opportunity for especially the women who are in female dominated class in the banking sector that are all going to get something out of this legislation in the end of the day. Let's finish on this. The, um, you touched on it kind of earlier. A lot of people look at these, these kinds of, uh, you know, um, moves by the government in terms of what, what, what's the cost of it going to be? What's the cost to the economy? Um, talk to me about not, not just that, uh, how, how you view, uh, uh, obviously, the advantages of moving to a pay equity regime, but, but also what having the federal government move on this might mean for the rest of the country. Well, one right now, the statistical evidence is available. Uh, women make, on average, about 32 cents less than what men make on average. And if you're in, of course, other groups, uh, women of color, Aboriginal women, women with disability, you're actually to be even more disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the cost that women have been paying for working in this society for so long has been enormous. Uh, so that's one statistical measurement. I think in the other side of this, of course, for um, uh, for society, uh, yeah, this is going to cost some money because if you're going to compensate them uh, to ensure that uh, they're their worth is the same as men uh, doing comparable work is going to cost the government money in terms of what it has to allocate, but in the private sector it has to do the same thing. And I think, uh, again, we're dealing with something that's been embedded in the, the, the way we have looked at women's work as a whole. And this is going to take some time because some of this go back decades. Why was that job undervalued? A large part of it because women were predominantly in that occupation. And now we have to look at how do we compare that to who else? And more importantly, how do we account for how we're going to evaluate uh, bringing their I salary guess, up? I guess I would have to ask, what is the cost of not addressing this inequality? That, you know, uh, the committee, uh, all of the inputs to the committee, all felt the same way, that it's inappropriate that we pay women less for the work that they do. Uh, and so, you know, will there be a cost? Um, most certainly, if you're going to, unless you're going to reduce men's salary by 32 cents, um, an hour, then uh, there's going to be a cost. But uh, I don't believe that uh, uh, that cost is exorbitant, and I don't believe it's inappropriate. And that's the cost of equality, and I think Canadians support equality in our society. And it's not viewed in isolation either, I guess. I mean, you're, you're, you're paying people more money, you're putting money back into the economy. Well, that's it's the not like you're just drawing money Absolutely. out. Absolutely, right? and yeah. I think that's yeah. the other side of this. I mean, women able to retire um, with dignity and not having to live in poverty because their salary was so low, so their pension is that smaller when they retire. They get a better salary, they got to have a better pension at the end of the day. I think also with the federal government tabling this legislation is going to have a very positive impact at the provincial level. Two provinces have major commitment to pay equity, both Ontario and Quebec. Yep. I think this will send a message across the country, listen folks, it's time for us to get together and try to do this. If we could do this, you can work with us. But also the reach will go into the private sector, the banking uh, yep. uh, community will be affected. They have come out, so they support the legislation. Mm -hmm. Of course, they have to meet that commitment now with submitting a plan, uh, working with their employees to develop something that's going to really uplift uh, women who work in the banking sector who's been underpaid for decades. And this is an opportunity to make uh, them, listen, I do my banking at many different sources, but I can tell you how good I feel uh, that women are gonna have equality working in the banking sector. All right, thank you both for your time. Thank you.